What do you think is one of the most neglected parts of restoring first century Christianity? Someone asks you that question, what are the things that come to your mind? You might say maybe evangelism. That's a possibility. It's something that, um, do we have the same type of fervor? Do we do it the same way that the first century Christians did? Perhaps faithfulness. You know, faithfulness to go to the point of persecution, to the point of being crucified or burned or, or drowned for the cause of Christ. Or perhaps zeal, just being excited and, and going through and being passionate about what the Lord is passionate about, as we've talked about in the past. You know, with all of these, I can agree. I'd say absolutely there's probably areas in all of these that we need to, to improve in. But I believe one thing that we, at least in American culture, fail to restore is the servant mentality. It's the same mentality that Jesus had while he was on this earth. The servant mentality is about humility. It's about service. It's about obedience. It's about gentleness and patience. You know, all of these words encapsulate the idea that we strive for with the servant attitude or the servant spirit. Some of y'all are familiar with Tim Jennings, and you may be familiar with Matt Basford. Tim is uh, connected to some of our members, but he wrote a song, and I was talking with him, and they went through and were talking about the idea of this attitude, or the servant attitude. And the words of that song, at least the first line that he has, and then I think Matt Basford added the others, but it says, Make me a servant, just like your son. For he was a servant, please make me one. Make me a servant, do what you must do to make me a servant, make me like you. Make me a servant, take all my pride, for I will be lowly, humble inside. Giving to others with all that I do and love for my brother, make me like you. Make me a servant, filled by your might, may all, and may all my labors shine with your light. Show me your footsteps and what I should do for now and forever. Make me like you. The name of that song, it's not in our books. I believe it's in the supplements with these, but it's called the servant song or servant song. And this attitude is manifested in Christ. And if you would turn over to Philippians chapter 2. It's where we're going to use the main section of our study this morning. In Philippians chapter 2, as we talk this morning about an attitude of service or the servant attitude. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, Paul was writing to this church and he says simply in verse 5, Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, the church at Philippi was a good church, but there were some among them that were divided. It wasn't over truth, or you could see that the remedy would be different. But as Paul was writing this letter, in part to deal with that, uh, he writes in Philippians 4 to these two women that were disagreeing that he wanted them to agree in the truth. They had both of their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but they weren't getting along together. So Paul writes this letter, in part to deal with this division. But Paul has confidence in these brethren that they're going to do the right thing. You see that here in verses 12 and 13 where he says, So then, my beloved brethren, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Paul's specific remedy for this church and for these brethren was this, an attitude of service, or the idea of humility. In American culture, the idea of being a servant does not go over very well. We are independent, we are focused on leaders, we're focused on the ones that are telling and directing and all of that type of thing. No one goes into a business saying, hey, I'm going to be the lowliest servant in this organization, or I'm going to be the lowliest servant here in this place. Nobody goes in with that attitude. Nobody goes in and has an attitude of what can I do for other people necessarily. Sometimes, sometimes you have that. 
But the focus is very much on me. What can I get out of it? What can I do? And how can I be benefited? But as you think here in Philippians chapter 2, Paul says, we're going to focus on this. We're going to flip this attitude around on itself and develop an attitude of service. What I want us to do this morning is look at Christ and how he had and how he tried to teach that to his disciples and how even they struggle with it. And then also look at some of the observations here in Philippians 2. With that being said, let's pick up here in verse 3. And before we get into that, I first off want to extend my appreciation to everyone for being here this morning. Definitely thankful for our visitors. Anyone that comes our way, we're definitely thankful for you. And hopeful that we can gain some good things this morning. Well, let's pick up here in Philippians 2. And I want us to pick up here in verse 3. And first off, understand this first point is that Christ had the servant attitude. I don't think I have to spend a whole long time proving that fact to you, but we can understand from Philippians chapter 2 some things that do point out this very, very fact. And here in verse 3, as he is talking here, look at what he says. He says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. The first thing that we need to understand about this is that humility is at the very core of being a servant. That means thinking other people are better than you, or being concerned about other people instead of being concerned about yourself. You know, these brethren needed to have humility. They needed to have a respect for, it's not to, to have the idea of just, oh, okay, I'm a terrible person. I'm, you know, everybody's just so much better than I am. That's not the attitude of self-depreciating yourself. But it is thinking of others more important than ourselves. That's the idea here in verse 4 about thinking about the interest of others. Paul's wanting to remind these brethren to have this humility of mind and regard others as more important. But how do they do this? Well, it's done by looking out for other people's interests, thinking about the other person. Instead of saying, oh, okay, here's what I think is best, I'm going to go through and actually put in the time and effort to think about what you need and what's important to you. That's hard, isn't it? You mean I don't use all my time about myself? I have to actually spend time and effort thinking, hey, someone else has needs that are just as important as mine, and I need to think about those what Paul was telling them they have to be focusing on. And Jesus is the perfect example of this mentality. Let me show you how he is. The first thing that you'll see is that Christ was willing to give up his rights. As you look here, continue on in verse 6. He tells them to have this same attitude that was also in Christ in verse 5. But look at verse 6. He says, "...who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He was in the form of God in the beginning. He was the creator. He was the sustainer. He was all of those things. He had everything. But he didn't view it as something to be grasped. That's that's a completely different attitude. He had all the things, but he didn't view it as, as a position. He didn't view it as reaching that CFO or that CEO in a company that I'm striving my whole life just to get to that point. That's not how he viewed it. Even though it was the most powerful position in all the universe, he didn't view it like that. As you look, he didn't view it as something to be grasped. He wasn't interested in attaining the highest level of strength or power. He didn't view equality like man does, as something to be fought for and desired. You think about the Caesars, how did they view themselves? As gods. I'm greater than everybody else. I want to get to that point so I can be like that. Uh, I was talking about this with a friend of mine that, uh, you know, in some religions, this is kind of the idea. If you do all these things, what do you get to be? I get to be God. Think about back there with Eve. Do you remember what the, what the desire of Eve was, one of the big problems? To be like God, to know good and evil. That's what she wanted. She wanted this same thing that Christ, even though he had it, he didn't. He didn't reach for it. He didn't try to just obtain that. He wasn't jealous over that. But also remember the desire of Babel. Wasn't it to reach into heaven? Mankind has always wanted this, hasn't it? More power, more strength, all these things. It's man's desires, but Jesus did not do that. He didn't view it as something to be grasped. 
And the truth is, he willingly gave it up. Because the next thing you'll see as well about the attitude of humility and what Christ has is that he took on the place of a servant. Back over there in chapter 2, he exists in the form of God, but he didn't regard it equality with something to be grasped. But, in verse 7, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. And you think about Jesus emptying himself, I don't know what all that meant. I do know two simple facts, that he was fully God and he was fully man. But I will say this, as you think about that idea, he clearly takes on a position that he did not have before, right? He was all God and then he became all man. Let's just think about that for a second. As you think about something you create or something that is uh, just maybe you've manufactured it, can you imagine uh, going through and being contained only in that container? Let's say you make mason jars, okay? You make mason jars, and then you have to go, and you're binding your whole power, everything you have, just in a mason jar. You're restraining yourself. Think about what Christ is doing. He is putting himself in a body that he himself has created. He's putting limitations on himself. He's, he's giving up things that he had. Not in the sense of deity. He was still deity. He had the powers and those types of things. But he didn't have a body before. He wasn't a servant. He didn't take on the position of man. You know, mankind, even though he doesn't like being a servant, even though he doesn't enjoy being a servant, the truth is, right there in the garden, what's he supposed to be doing? Serving. Man was made to be a servant. God was not made to be a servant. But Jesus voluntarily took it on. He gave those things up. You know... Jesus humbled himself beyond measure in taking on the form of the man. He came and he, he didn't have to in the sense that it was something he, he was forced to do. Nobody's twisting his arm to say, hey, you've got to go down there. But he intentionally did it of his own free will. You know, I don't know exactly how all that worked out, but I will say when Jesus came to this earth, he was relying on his parents, wasn't he? He takes on the form of a child. He was relying on his parents. He was subject to his parents. He was subject to the other human institutions that he himself created. So we fully understand what he humbled himself to. It's a very, very powerful concept when he says there in Philippians 2, he took on the form of a servant. He wasn't a servant before, but he willingly took it on. But ultimately as well, part of the idea of humility is that he was obedient to the Father. Because here in verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know, Jesus' ultimate display of humility was in obedience on the cross, wasn't it? I mean, it was great that he came as a servant, it was great that he was willing to, to come into a body that he himself had created. But as Hebrews 5 talks about, that he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. The attitude of obedience in, in his desire to always be completely, relentlessly devoted to the Father's will. We talked about this whenever we were discussing taking on the challenge to be like Jesus. He was relentlessly focused, always the Father's will. It was crystal clear in his mind. He knew exactly what he was here for, and he never got off track. It was always about the Father's will, always about obedience. But this service wasn't just come here and live the perfect life, then go back home. It was come on a rescue mission to die for the creatures that are rejecting you, that don't give you the time of day, the ones that don't love you, the ones that are your enemies, the ones that put you on the cross and murdered you, you go save them. That's humility. That's giving up my rights. That's taking on the place of a servant. And as we talked about just a couple of weeks ago, he was murdered unjustly at the hands of evil men in order to save those same evil, wicked men. That's why God gives him the name that is above every name. Because there is no one that is ever, ever, ever on the level of Jesus and does not and, and has his type of attitude. But that's why he says, have this mind in you that was in Christ Jesus. Strive for that type of attitude. 
Well, the truth is, as you can imagine, it's a pretty difficult concept, right? It's a very, very difficult thing. And we learn a lot of those type of lessons with our children. I mean, you look at all these things right here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just think about your child. Yeah, you're giving up your rights. I can't go out on these weekends. I can't go and do what I want to do anymore. Yeah, what are you doing with that child? Well, you've got to be taking care of him. You've got to learn the attitude of a servant and on and on. But not to the point of Christ. So much more. But even though we learn those things, Christ is trying to teach his disciples this as you look through the Gospels. Go over to the book of Mark with me. I will say this. Jesus, of, of the things that Jesus is trying to communicate to his disciples, this is one thing that has been brought to my attention that he is trying to stress with them is you've got to have this mentality. And Mark just draws this beautiful picture here in these few chapters of his struggle with them, of, of how they're not getting the point. In Mark chapter 8, and in verse 31, I want us to, to look at some passages. So hold here in the book of Mark. He is going through and he's communicating to them about, uh, about how he is going to die. So as we look here at the book of Mark and how they're struggling mighty with this concept, here in verse 31, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Then you remember what Peter did? Peter said, no, no, that's not going to happen. Don't do that. And you remember what he turned around and said? You better be willing to give up everything to be a servant of mine. But you'll notice this theme is repeated, that each time he'll go through and talk about their death, the disciples are going to balk at it, and they're not going to understand. They're going to be wondering, why is this happening? Well, as you go through, turn over to Mark chapter 9. In Mark chapter 9, he's giving them some hard lessons about discipleship. He's trying to teach them the lessons that they need here in the book of Mark. So in Mark chapter 9, here in verse 31, in Mark 9 and verse 31, you're going to see the very similar thing. Back there in chapter 8, it's the first time. So he brings this up, first time, I'm going to go to the cross. Peter's like, not going to happen. And then he gives them some hard lessons on discipleship. Well, look here in Mark chapter 9, here in verse 31. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, same idea. I'm going to go and I'm going to die on the cross. But they don't understand this statement. But then look here in verse 33, what he talks to them about. They came to Capernaum and he was in the house. He began to question them, what were you discussing on the way? Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Taking a child, he set, them, set him before them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me but him who sent me. You know, we don't have specific information on to why the disciples are acting this way. But as you think, if the death of the teacher is going to happen... You know, maybe they're not concerned about it like they should. Maybe they're thinking, hey, who's going to fill in if Jesus dies? I mean, that's a possibility, probably. I wouldn't say that's necessarily what's going on. But it seems like these people are still concerned about themselves. What are they discussing? Jesus goes through and brings us up. Okay, who's going to be the greatest? He says, you've got to be the, be the servant. And what he does is he takes a child, an innocent child, and puts it down in front of him and says, okay, here, here's the idea. Here's what I want you to see. Here's what I want you to imitate. Well, here in Mark chapter 9, what he does right after this is he goes through some really hard lessons about cutting off offenses, cutting off your hand. He talks about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And you remember their reaction over in Matthew 19? It'd be better not to get married. And then he goes in Mark chapter 10, and he discusses the perfect Christian or the perfect citizen of the kingdom, the rich young ruler. He's been doing everything. He's the one that's been obeying the law. He's been doing all these right things. He's made all the right choices. But he trips at the finish line because he won't give up something for the Lord. Kind of sounds like what we talked about in Mark chapter 8 again, right? But then, look at what also happens here in Mark chapter 9. 
right after he laid out all these things about the hard discipleship in verse 13. And they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. What did he just tell them to do? Receive children, be humble like them, and you don't understand it. There in verse 14, but when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And then the person they thought belonged to it was the rich young ruler, and he's not. But there's a child who has the humility and the appreciation and willing to give up for their master. Yeah, that's who I want. I want the child, not the rich young ruler. But then look also in chapter 10. A little bit farther, right after this, they go through and discuss about how they've given up different things for the Lord's sake. But then here in verse 32, they were going up on they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were fearful. And again he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him. Same thing, third time I'm going to the cross. Then look at what happens right after that. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever you ask of us. And you remember what happened there. We've discussed that. Do you see the picture? We're not understanding what you're doing, Jesus. We don't understand that you want children. These people are good, but you want a child? That doesn't make any sense. What, you want us to, to change the way we operate in marriage? That doesn't make any sense. We want, and Jesus wants servants in his kingdom. People that are willing to give up the things that are difficult in their life. He wants humility. Again, Jesus hammers them on service. Service, service, service. But consider these as well. Over there in Luke chapter 22 about the Lord's Supper. These things were happening just in the subsequent weeks leading up to Jesus' death, in the subsequent days. Then in Luke chapter 22, turn over there. I want you to understand the severity of what's happening here in Luke chapter 22. Because as we talked about last week in Mark 10 and Mark 11, Mark 10 is where you have him come in, the triumphal entry, Mark 11, cursing of the fig tree, cleansing of the temple, Then you have him going right onto the cross later that week. But here in Luke chapter 22, look at what day it is. Now the feast of unleavened bread, which is the Passover, was approaching. Then he goes and he tells his brethren, okay, we're going to partake of the Passover. This is right before he's about to die. Everything he's been talking about in the book of Mark. So this is right there. And then he goes and he partakes of the Passover. Just think about this. This is the night he's going to be betrayed. This is Thursday night, partaking of the Lord's Supper. We're in Jerusalem. I'm going to be on the cross in the morning, telling you a vital lesson right before I die, right here at the Passover. And look at what they're arguing about in verse 24. And there arose also a dispute among them as to which of them was regarded to be the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way with you. But the one who is greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. What's the message he's trying to drive? Service. Service. I mean, it makes sense, right? They're the big boys in town. They just rolled into town. Triumphal entry, Jesus' disciples, all this reputation, all these things. Jesus says you need to keep your head on straight and understand it. But then you remember the final lesson he taught his disciples? In John chapter 13, in John 13, right about this same time as in Luke 22, Jesus got down on his knees. He took it and girded himself, 
And he washed the disciples' feet and said, Here, here's an example of what I'm trying to get through your heads. It's about being servants. It's not about power. It's not about position. It's not about being lords. It's not about doing what you want to do or what I want to do. It's about what the Father wants. It's about being concerned about the interests of others. Jesus gave up his rights took on the role of a servant, and he made an everlasting example in the minds of the disciples of exactly who they were supposed to be, and it was servants. So, do you ever find yourselves in the mind of the apostles? I'm concerned about myself. I'm concerned about what I want to do. I'm concerned about my way being the best way. And you've ever feel like, I feel like I can be like the disciples. Jesus is sitting there going again and again and again to the same thing. He's just hitting me over the head and I'm not fully getting it. It doesn't even seem they fully get it till after he's raised. And then perhaps even to the ascension. They don't understand what's going on. But yet the thing he's stressing so much at the end of his life is this concept of service. Well, the truth is, Christ desires for us to have the servant attitude as well. So, back over in Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2. Paul is here talking about the desire that he has for them. But people like Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus were all changed to be servants of Christ here in this text. This was a while back, but I did a lesson on four examples for Philippi whenever I first started here. And one of the things I talked about was these four examples. And these men were all servants who had realized the mind of Christ, that he was the one to be served, and they were changed. They had taken the mind of Christ and put it into their mind and viewed themselves differently. Paul said, I'm willing to be a sacrifice for you. I'll be poured out on the service of your faith. You look at Timothy, he was willing to have that same mindset as Paul, and Epaphroditus nearly died trying to go for the cause of Christ. People were changed by the attitude of Christ and how they were servant, or how he was a servant. But in Philippians 1 here in verse 27, Paul desires this for the brethren as well. He says, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. What do they need to be worthy of? The gospel of Christ. That attitude needs to be in them. Then he goes right here into chapter 2 and he says in verse 1, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion... Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. You see what he says? If you got this, if you got encouragement, if you got consolation and you got fellowship, you got affection and compassion, you got all these things, have this mind to be united, to be joyful, and to be loving. Those are the things that are there that he wants for these brethren. But this change had to come from inside out. That's why he goes back here to verse 3 and says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. And do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. These people needed to change their motivations They needed to change their mind. They had to think differently in all these different situations. They had to view things and view the world differently. If they viewed the world as something to be conquered, if they viewed the world like the Gentiles where I can just put down the people that disagree with me and don't like it, that's not going to work. That's not how it operates. And that's not how Christ was either. But as you look in Philippians chapter 2, he tells them, though, that they need to work out their salvation there in verse 12 and 13. And 
they needed to prove themselves to be a particular type of people. Look here in verse 14. It says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory, because I did not run in vain, nor toil in vain. That was Paul's desire, for them to start thinking about other people and how they could be of service in order to help them. So let's examine this question. He desired it for the brethren as well, but how can we fulfill the desire of Paul? And you might even word it this way. You know, uh, well, I <laughs> kind of flipped myself around a little bit there. But how can, we to do it? how can we do it? We can put God's will above all others. That's the point here, isn't it? That's what Jesus did. He put it above all others. We put the desires and interests of others above our own. In matters of judgment, he's not saying in matters of faith, or if someone's going to lose their soul, you don't compromise that. But everything else, you're willing to, to, to work out. We desire unity, love, encouragement, fellowship, affection, and compassion. Isn't that the words he used back there in chapter 2 and verse 1? We stress teamwork, respect, and sharing with one another. All the things you learn, remember back in kindergarten, <laughs> being a child. But I will say this does mean we have to bear with things we don't like. You think there was times Jesus didn't like being in this body? You think there was times he didn't like what he had to do? Yeah, yeah, that was, that was definitely going to be there. And in matters of judgment, you remember what Paul said in Romans 15? That the strong were to bear with the scruples of the weak. They had to have that love and care for one another. Now, the weak weren't supposed to bind it on the strong either, but there was an attitude of love and respect on both sides of that. You know, what happens so often is that as children, we understand all these vital lessons. You know, people say you learn everything that you, you need in life whenever you're in kindergarten, right? That's, that's just a general thing that people will say. But it seems like as children, we understand these things, at least to an extent. But whenever we get older, what happens? Oh, I know so much. Or the world is this way. Or the world acts this way. And we get conditioned to act a certain way because... We're adults now. And to an extent, you know, we're supposed to grow up in Christ, and I understand all those things. But too many times we grow up in the things we were supposed to keep whenever we were a child, and we're childish in the things we should have grown out of. Isn't that what happened in Corinth? They were doing the opposite of what was happening here in Philippi. So I ask this question to you. Paul could expect obedience from Philippi. Could he expect obedience from you? Because the truth is, the servant attitude is not just for great Christians. It's not for the Christians that just have it all together. It's not for just the well-known brothers or sisters. It is for every single Christian, from the youngest of us to the oldest of us. Every Christian has got to wrestle down their pride, put it into submission, and submit to the will of God and put the interest of others above their own. Paul writes this in Philippians 2 to appeal to them, but do not be mistaken. He expected them to obey it. It was not a suggestion. It was an expectation of being a Christian. Because, as we've been talking about this year, we're to be like Christ. Isn't that what we've been discussing? Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you looking at this picture that is painted of, of being a servant like your son. And we realize that so often we get so interested in what we want to do instead of what you want and what others may need. We ask that you help us to have the mind of Jesus in our mind so that we can become transformed through that renewing of our mind to, to do the will of your Son and to become better servants.
put ourselves in, in the proper position to help and to, to benefit one another. If we have these things that are laid out here, help us to, to have the mindset that extends from them. Help us to love one another here in this place and to put your will above all things. Forgive us of our sins and in your son's name. Amen. Well, that is the servant and that is the king that invites you to come to him today. He invites you to turn away from your sins. He's already died for them. He's conquered everything. But you have to change. You have to be willing to repent, to turn and put your sin away. If you are willing to do that, we can immerse you in water to have your sins washed away if you believe in him. If you're a Christian and you're probably like me, you look at this lesson and say, wow, it's kind of like Isaiah when he saw the glory of God. Woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips. (laughs) There's many things to work on in this, but we can pray for one another and we can encourage one another. If we can help you at all, come forward as we stand and sing.